Welcome to the Chic Assignment Check-In for February 2022. Hello everyone, Jennifer L. Scott here and welcome back to The Daily Connoisseur. This is the Chic Assignment Check-In. We are going to be going over all the assignments this month. I'm so excited to get into it. <laughs> the Chic Assignment is brought to us by the Chic Society, which is the private membership group I have here on YouTube. Membership is only $1.99 a month. There are also upper tiers. You're seeing them here. I have the Chic Connoisseurs and the Elegant Connoisseurs. I do one vodcast every Friday and we go live or do a Zoom call once a month. It's so much fun. We even have a pen pal program. So I have you all writing letters to each other the old fashioned way. It's amazing. <laughs> Be sure to stay tuned till the end of the video when I give the Elegant Connoisseurs their mentions. There's lots of amazing Amazing artists, writers, business owners, and high patrons of the channel that we feature in that portion of the video. So thank you to the Chic Society for bringing us this wonderful series. Chic assignment number one was to listen to the music of Valerie Coleman and I assigned the beautiful video and performance of Umoja and that was performed by Imani Wins. And Valerie is in this video, she's playing the flute. I loved this piece. When I came across this piece, I thought that it directly related to uh, the fourth chic assignment, which is to observe the birds, because this sounds to me like happy bird song. It is so beautiful. So I reached out to Valerie on Instagram to see if she could leave us a message message or something for this video. She's clearly a very busy woman, very high demand. So if she gets back to me, I will update you and I will definitely let you know. But let's learn a little bit about her right now. So Valerie Coleman is regarded by many as an iconic artist who continues to pave her unique path as a composer. She's Grammy nominated and she was highlighted as one of the top 35 women composers by the Washington Post and she was named Performance Today's 2020 Classical Woman of the Year. So she is the former flutist of Amani Wins, and she is the creator and founder of that beautiful ensemble. It has a 24-year legacy, and it was featured in a dedicated exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. She co-founded and currently performs as flutist of the performer-composer trio Umama Womama. So let's talk about Umoja, which is the title of the piece Piece that we listened to this month. So Umoja is Swahili for unity. That's what that word means. And a few of you told me that in the comments and I love that because I didn't know that. It embodies a sense of tribal unity through the feel of a drum circle and the sharing of history through traditional call and response form. Maybe that's why I got the bird song from it because birds do call and response to each other. Valerie wrote, this version honors the simple melody that ever was, but is now a full exploration to the meaning of freedom and unity. Now more than ever, Umoja has to ring a strong and beautiful anthem for the world we live in today. And I could not agree more. So I hope that you thoroughly enjoyed that and that you have discovered Valerie Coleman's music for yourself as part of your audio repertoire. Chic assignment number two was to study the artwork of Vincent van Gogh. So I immersed myself in van Gogh this month. I read several biographies on him and I looked at his works just as I'm sure many of you did. And I was reminded of the incredible story of his life, which was very tragic. So we are going to get into his biography right now. I pulled all of the pertinent details for his biography from many different sources and I created my own document here that I will be reading to you from. So here we go. Vincent van Gogh was a post-impressionist painter and one of the world's greatest artists Though sadly he struggled with mental illness and remained poor and unrecognized his entire life and only became recognized for his great talent posthumously. His most famous paintings include Starry Night and Sunflowers. Van Gogh completed more than 2,100 works, including 860 oil paintings and more than 1,300 watercolors, drawings, and sketches. Several of his paintings now rank among the most expensive in the world. Iris is sold for a record $53.9 million, and his portrait of Dr. Gachet sold for $82.5 million. A few of Van Gogh's most well-known artworks include Starry Night. Many of you said this was your favorite. So Van Gogh painted Starry Night 
in the asylum that he was staying at in St. Remy in France, which we'll get to later, uh, in 1889, the year before his death. So let's learn about Van Gogh, starting with his early life. Van Gogh was born on March 30th, 1853 in Groot Zundert, Netherlands. His father was a minister and his mother, Anna Cornelia Carbentus, was an artist who loved nature, painting, and watercolors. Van Gogh was born exactly one year after his parents' first son, also named Vincent, was stillborn. He would visit the tomb of his older brother and the tombstone had his name and birthday on it. Now, let's talk about this for a second because I've looked for this everywhere and nobody has said anything about it, so I'm going to say it. So <laughs> I believe that what we see, what we put before our eyes is very powerful visuals, right? So think about this. He was born exactly one year after his stillborn brother, who was also named Vincent. So his mother would always take him to the cemetery and on the tombstone, he saw Vincent Van Gogh and his birthday. And that was constantly before his eyes, even as a child. Now, I believe that that is really powerful and that might have always put death in the forefront of his mind and his consciousness. Imagine seeing your name and your birthday on a tombstone, even from when you were a child. So I just, I don't know, his life is tragic, he died young, Okay, let's talk about his brother, Theo. Van Gogh was the eldest of six living children. He had two younger brothers, Theo, who worked as an art dealer and supported his older brother's art, and Cor. He had three younger sisters, Anna, Elizabeth, and Wilhelmine. Let's talk about his education. So Van Gogh left school at the age of 15 to work at an art dealership because his family was struggling financially. He eventually moved to London and he fell in love with English culture. He would visit art galleries there and he loved reading Dickens and Eliot. He fell in love with his landlady's daughter, Eugenie Loyer, and he proposed marriage to her, but she rejected him. He took it really badly and he suffered a mental breakdown. He threw away all his books except for the Bible and he decided to devote his life to God. He would tell people at the art gallery not to go buy the worthless art and naturally because of this, he was fired. Let's talk about his life as a preacher. So Van Gogh wanted to become a minister and he began teaching at a Methodist boys school and preached to the congregation. He was denied entrance to the School of Theology in Amsterdam, however, because he refused to take the Latin exams, calling it a dead language of poor people. <laughs> okay. He went to the Church of Belgium, and in 1878, he volunteered to move to a poor coal mine in the south of Belgium. He preached and ministered to the poor and sick, and he also drew pictures of the coal miners. They called him Christ of the Coal Mines. But the evangelical committee was not happy. They felt his ministry there had the tone of martyrdom, so they didn't renew his contract. He had to look for work elsewhere. So you're going to begin to note that Van Gogh faced rejection in nearly every facet of his life. Rejection from women, rejection from the church. We're going to look into that a bit more later. Let's talk about how he found solace in his art. So in 1880, Van Gogh moved to Brussels to become an artist, even though he never had formal training. His brother Theo offered to support him financially. Theo clearly saw potential in his older brother. Van Gogh took solace in his art and it helped keep him balanced emotionally. He began to work on the potato eaters in 1885. By this time, Theo was living in Paris and he thought the potato eaters wouldn't be well received there because impressionism had become the trend but Van Gogh decided to come to Paris anyway. In Paris, Van Gogh saw Impressionism for the first time and became inspired by the use of color and light. He began to study with Toulouse-Lautrec and Camille Pissarro and more. So let's just cut here because I love how he just waltzes into Paris and studies with Toulouse-Lautrec and Camille Pissarro. They were masters in their own right. So I just, I don't know, these stories just fascinate me. I love how they are all connected. They all knew each other. And uh, Van Gogh didn't think very highly of himself, yet he was studying with these masters already. Also, another takeaway from that is that when you study with the masters, you yourself can become a master. Hiring models was very costly back then, so he and his friends posed for each other's paintings. Van Gogh was a very passionate and intense individual, and he would argue with his friends about their paintings and became alienated from him, and they grew tired of his bickering and complaining. Okay, so let's talk about Van Gogh's love life, which was completely disastrous. 
He had a pattern of falling in love with women who were in trouble, as he thought that he could help them. He fell in love with his cousin Kate after she became a widow. She rejected his advances. And I find this very, I'm not judging, okay, but I find this really bizarre considering his religious fervor. But he fell in love with Klasina Maria Hornick, who was an alcoholic prostitute. She became his mistress and model. Hornick returned to prostitution, which depressed Van Gogh, and in 1882, his family threatened to cut him off financially unless he left her. So I'm just saying that he was such a contradiction in all areas of his life. You know, he was a strong religious man. I mean, he wanted to become a preacher, but then he makes the prostitute his mistress. So it's like his, his actions were never in line with his beliefs. Do you see what I mean there? In 1888, Van Gogh moved to Arles in the south of France, into the yellow house that's now so famous, and he spent almost all his money on paint. Okay, let's talk about the ear incident. In 1888, Van Gogh was leading a very unhealthy lifestyle in Arles. He ate bread, he drank coffee, and absinthe, and that's pretty much it. He was not only suffering from physical ailments, but by now it was clear that his mental health was rapidly declining as well. He reportedly even drank turpentine and ate paint. Naturally, Theo was worried and he gave the artist Paul Gauguin, another master, money to go watch Vincent in Arles. But Vincent van Gogh and Paul, they did not get on well after time, and after one strong argument, Gauguin left, and van Gogh ran after him with a razor in his hand. A few hours later, van Gogh went to a brothel, and he gave something to a prostitute called Rachel. It was his ear. He asked her to keep this object carefully. The next morning, the police found him in his room and sent him to the Hotel Dieu hospital. Theo came to see him on Christmas day to find his brother very weak and having violent seizures. Van Gogh was released from the hospital on January 7th, 1889, but he remained depressed. He turned to nature and painting, but he couldn't find peace. He had to be hospitalized again. He would paint at the yellow house during the day and return to the hospital at night. Eventually, the people of Arles signed a petition to say he was dangerous, and he moved to St. Paul de Mossal, an asylum in saint Remy de provence On May 8, 1889, he began painting in the hospital gardens. In November 1889, he was invited to exhibit his paintings in Brussels. He sent six paintings, including irises and Starry Night. On January 31st, 1890, Theo and his wife, Johanna, gave birth to a boy. They named him Vincent Willem van Gogh after Theo's brother. Around this time, Theo sold van Gogh's The Red Vineyard's painting for 400 francs. Also around this time, Dr. Paul Gachet, who lived in Auvers, about 20 miles north of Paris, agreed to take van Gogh as his patient. Van Gogh moved to Auvers and rented a room. And finally, let's talk about his death. On July 27, 1890, Vincent Van Gogh went out to paint in the morning, carrying a loaded pistol, and he shot himself in the chest, but the bullet did not kill him. He was found bleeding in his room. Van Gogh was distraught about his future because in May of that year, his brother Theo had visited and spoke to him about needing to be stricter with his finances. Van Gogh took that to mean Theo was no longer interested in selling his art. Van Gogh was taken to a nearby hospital and his doctor doctors sent for Theo, who arrived to find his brother sitting up in bed and smoking a pipe. They spent the next couple of days talking together, and then Van Gogh asked Theo to take him home. On July 29, 1890, Vincent Van Gogh died in the arms of his brother, Theo. He was only 37 years old. Theo, who was suffering from syphilis and weakened by his brother's death, died six months after his brother in a Dutch asylum. He was buried in Utrecht, but in 1914, Theo's wife, Johanna, who was a dedicated supporter of Van Gogh's work, had Theo's body reburied in the Auvers Cemetery next to Vincent. Let's talk about Vincent's legacy. So Theo's wife, Johanna, then collected as many of Van Gogh's paintings as she could, but discovered that many had been destroyed or lost as Van Gogh's own mother had thrown away cratefuls of his art. I read that and I'm like, what? On March 17, 1901, 71 of Van Gogh's paintings were displayed at a show in Paris, and his fame grew enormously. His mother lived long enough to see her son hailed as an artistic genius. I have chills. Today, Vincent van Gogh is considered one of the greatest artists in human history. Wow. Ugh. Every time I revisit his biography, I just, so many things pop up to me. I get the chills. I think we can learn so many lessons from his life. Van Gogh was clearly talented, passionate, and dedicated. He also struggled from mental illness. That's very clear. But a major problem was he didn't know how amazing he was. He didn't know how talented he was. He probably thought really lowly of himself. 
And it's so tragic to me that he became known as one of the greatest painters in human history, but that he never knew that while he was on this earth. And it's such a shame. But anyway, I think we can all learn from his work and appreciate his work. My personal favorites by Van Gogh are his flowers. I love the irises, I love those. In fact, uh, my parents had a print of the irises in our home growing up. And I also love the vase with daisies and poppies. But of course, all of his works are just so, they're very deep, they're very whimsical. They have movement to them. You could sense he was a passionate person. So I hope that you truly enjoyed learning about Vincent Van Gogh this month. Let us know what your favorite Van Gogh painting is down below and what you learned from his life. Chic assignment number three was to journal your gratitude this month. So I hope that you took me at my word. I hope that you actually did it because people have been telling me to do this for years and I've never done it. I'll write other things, but I'm not writing down what I'm grateful for. So I've been doing this every day since the year began. Here's what I've noticed, very powerful differences that seem subtle, but when I look back, they're incredible. Because I have been journaling my gratitude, saying everything I'm thankful for, some days I focus on the really big things I'm thankful for, sometimes it's all the small things, sometimes I go in themes, you know, people that I'm grateful for, or uh, that type of thing. But what I notice when I do this is that my capacity for gratitude has deeply expanded and that when I encounter a situation that might be perceived as negative or bad, or even like a, a person who's like someone online who leaves me a comment or whatever, I am immediately able to jump to the good in the situation and what I'm thankful for. It's like it's reprogrammed my brain, which is really big. I just, I can't recommend it enough. There's something very powerful about writing things down with your hand. I'm not talking about electronics. I'm talking about get a pen <laughs> and some paper or a journal and write it out. Last week you saw my uh, morning routine video, which is one of my favorites. I loved it. And I shared this gorgeous moon phases journal. How beautiful is this? And pen. And this is from Design Works Inc. So I loved it. So I'll leave that link down below. You can find a journal anywhere but just write down your gratitude every day and see what it does for you. Um, so I'm able to look at the good in every situation now. And a lot of things that previously would have bothered me don't move me. I don't know, it's crazy. So <laughs> let me know if you have experienced the same thing. And the final chic assignment was to observe the birds this month. And I know many of you have done this, you have told me about it, and it's wonderful. So we have a bird feeder in our backyard and I'm constantly looking at the birds. I like to have my meals outside as often as I can and I watch them, I love them. We have some pretty incredible birds. We have common birds like doves and crows and sparrows, but we also have robin redbreasts and goldfinches and an egret that comes and visits us. This past month, we went on a family reunion to La Jolla and the most incredible osprey came and sat on the balcony of the house we were staying in. And so I took some amazing footage of it, which you're seeing here. And it was wonderful because I love bird watching. I used to do this with my dad when I was little and we had the Peterson bird guide, which I still have today. And this is an updated version, but I love looking up the birds and identifying the birds. It is such a fun hobby, I think. And, and I'm just, I love wild birds. I feel so connected to them and they bring me into the present moment. And I love observing them and their habits and how they live, how they talk to each other. So I'm always watching the birds. Sometimes I'll take an early evening bath when the sun is still up and I have the window open and I could see the tops of the trees from our garden and I watch the birds. <laughs> it's wonderful, it's so peaceful. So I hope that you enjoyed bird watching this month. Let us know what birds you saw in your area. And now we are going to do the Elegant Connoisseur Mentions. The 90 Day Memoir Workshop with Alan Watt from the LA Writers Lab. Amy Floor from Azalea Spa Goods. Bernadette M. Petrata from Polite Society School of Etiquette. Jenny Williams from Carrot Top Paper Shop. Elaine Brisebois, Certified Nutritionist and Women's Weight Loss Coach. Emily McNeil, Fine Art. Ashley Buffa, Freedom Mom Smart Kid Chore System. Guy Blaze, author of Love Like the French. Indiana Davis from Willow Nook Seasonal Subscription Box. Carrie Van Hooser, author of Tis the Season for Poetry. Lindy Sellers, YouTuber. Nicole Brignol, founder of Lovely Bits. Sarah Miller from SarahMillerJewelry.com. Mrs. Shockley from A Home for Elegance. 
Sarah Morgan Wellness, Allen Scottish Shortbread, Sturm Brothers Custom Design and Fine Jewelry, Catherine Ray, Adelaide Beer, Carly Tom from Living in Loveliness, Cindy Bulharowski, Janelyn Voigt, Janice Leitner, Jet Rally Heron, Gina K. Kenry, Jenny Candelaria, Juliette Keeler Laban, Julie Coleman, Linda Eckloff, Marie Caudill, and Maria Condor. Thank you so much to the Chic Society for bringing us today's video. I'll leave the link down below if you'd like to join, or you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. Make sure if you do join, you join on your laptop, not on your phone because iTunes marks up the cost. After you join, you can watch the Chic Society videos on any device you want. And yes, you do have access to all the videos I've ever done in the Chic Society once you join. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the Chic Assignment for February. Keep it going until the end of the month. And don't worry, we're going to continue this in March. Keep calm and remain classy, everyone. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.